Case Western Reserve University's Great Thinker series proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. These lectures are presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. With the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and MediaVision. This evening, I'm very pleased to welcome Nicole Steinmetz, who is an assistant professor of biomedical engineering at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, and is a, leading a research laboratory interfacing bio-inspired molecular engineering approaches with medical research. In 2015, this year, she was a young, named a young, investig a young innovator of cellular and biomolecular engineering, and in 2014, she was one of Crane's Cleveland's 40 Under 40. Uh, she's also a world-class skater. Tonight, she will talk, be giving our first lecture in our series, Welcome to the Nano World, entitled Black-Eyed Peas to Biomedical Nanotechnology. Please welcome Dr. Nicole Steinmetz. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for the invitation and the kind introduction. Um, so from molecular farming to molecular medicine is the title, slightly changed title of my talk. And what we do in uh, our research program, we start out in the greenhouse where we grow plants. And we use these plants as factories to produce plant viruses. Now we're not so much interested in the plant virus from a virology perspective or from an infectious, looking at this as an infectious agent. We are interested in viruses from a materials perspective, from a bioengineering perspective. And our goal is to engineer viruses into useful medicines that could be used to diagnose or treat a disease. So our mission is to push to new frontiers in medicine through engineering of biology-inspired nanotechnologies. Our vision is the translation of promising candidates into commercial or clinical applications. And what we do is we start out in the greenhouse, we produce these plant viruses, and we look at the plant virus as a nanomaterial, as a small scale material that we then engineer for applications in diagnosis, prognosis, and therapeutic intervention. Now what I want to start out with is maybe answering some questions and explaining the terminology. So what is nanotechnology? What is a biology-inspired nanotechnology? And what do plant viruses have to do with all this? So what is nanotechnology? If we look up the term nanotechnology, we will find this uh, definition. Nanotechnology is the manipulation, of, um, the manipulation and study of objects at the nanometer size scale. What's really important here is the nanometer size scale. So it's the study of small objects that are at the nanometer size scale. Now if we look at this on the spectrum, looking at very small objects to slightly larger objects on this uh, spectrum here, where on the left we have single atoms. And on the right we have uh, a human hair, this uh, scanning electron micrograph of a human hair. Now human hair is still visible by the naked eye. It's a small object. If you look at the diameter, it's on the millimeter size scale or submillimeter. And on the other spectrum, we have atoms. Now if we go from the human hair and we go into the smaller regions, red blood cells, bacteria, these objects we can only see if we use a microscope. If we go further down to the nanometer size scale where we have virus particles, DNA, other nanomaterials, antibodies, those materials we can only visualize if we use an electron microscope. And then if we go further down and down, we need to use more advanced uh, microscopy. So what is the nanometer size scale? The nanometer size scale is somewhere in between atoms and small objects that we can still sort of see by naked eye. Um, the prefix nano, scientifically speaking, denotes a billionth of something. A billionth of a meter, that's a nanometer. A billionth of a second, that would be a nanosecond. So we now know what is nanotechnology. It's the science of small objects, but why do we care about nanotechnology and why is it useful in the context of medicine? Now if we look at the nanometer size scale, these objects are small enough that they can navigate the circulatory system, they can navigate tissues and cells, 
They are much smaller than a, than a human cell. Cell are on the micron size scale. So the nano size scale is a thousand times smaller than the micron size scale. So nanoparticles, there's, um, there was a picture of a nanoparticle, or we can see a nanoparticle here inside the cell. The, the nanoparticle is much smaller than the cell, so nanoparticles can enter cells. And this is useful because we can engineer these nanoparticles in order to carry medicines or contrast agents in order to visualize a diseased cell or to deliver a, a therapeutic to the diseased cell. Now we have a quite active um, outreach program um, with the goal to disseminate uh, new findings in nanomedicine to the general public. So this is a great event for us to maybe showcast uh, some of the um, efforts that, that, uh, that we're working on. So a few years ago, I teamed up with uh, Krista Knight and Barry Brenniger, who together are a retro-forward musical writing team. And together with them, we have performed uh, several theater plays now, and we are developing video clips to highlight the adventures of nanoparticles within the body. Um, and to, to get started, I want to show you one of our videos. So because chemotherapy is not targeted, we needed to develop a superhero, a nanoman, a nanoparticle that can carry the chemotherapy to the cancer. So we have now developed the nanoparticle, nanoman, a superhero. Nanoman has been injected into the patient and is getting directions now. Go, go, nanoman, fight that tumor man. But of course, curing cancer is no walk through the park. So there's biological barriers that we need to overcome. When the nanoparticle is injected into the body, the immune system is alarmed and macrophages, immune cells, are now attacking the virus particle or the, the nanoparticle in this case. So, but we as engineers can equip the nanoparticle by giving it a polymeric shield that will now shield the particle from interaction with the immune cells. So it can escape the immune cells and continue its journey to find and fight that tumor man. So lessons learned from the nanoman, nanoparticles can carry therapeutics. And the idea is that by carrying the therapeutics, we are limiting the undesired toxicities to healthy tissues. So that the drug is packaged inside the nanoparticle and it will deliver this uh, medicine then to cancer cells while avoiding healthy cells. But there's biological barriers. As soon as a nanoparticle is injected into the body, it's recognized as a foreign object. So we as engineers need to devise novel methods and tools in order to allow nanoparticles to evade the immune system and other biological barriers and enable it to target, find uh, the target site and deliver the therapeutic. And there are several basic um, concepts that we can explore in nanomedical engineering. And the basic principles or the basic design parameters are nanoparticle shape and nanoparticle surface chemistry. So we can either choose a Oh, I apologize. Um, we can either use a, a spherical particle, as shown at the top here, or we can make a slightly elongated structure, or we could use a highly filamentous structure. So all these particles, if they were co-injected into a patient, would behave very differently. They will experience different flow properties within circulation. They will interact differently with cells. The second design parameter would be to, to change the surface chemistry so we can make these hairy looking particles that now contain or uh, have polymers on the surface that will help evade the immune system 
or we can, we can tailor the surface chemistry with chemical cues so that the particle can bind to molecular signatures at a disease site, but, but avoiding healthy tissues. So kind of give the particle some directions with molecular zip codes to find the desired target site. So I want to show you an experiment that we did uh, a few years ago um, that was published uh, when I was uh, still a postdoc at the Scripps Research Institute. Now in this study, we wanted to evaluate the impact of surface chemistry. So we started out with our bare nanoparticles. So these particles are not modified with any surface chemistries. Um, this was a preclinical study with an animal model bearing a prostate tumor. In this case, we labeled the prostate um, cancer cells with a green fluorescent protein. So this allows us to visualize this tumor under a microscope shown here in green. Our nanoparticles were then injected into these animals bearing the tumors, and we are looking at the signal shown as a heat map on the right. These are the nanoparticles. You can see at an early time point, there's a blood vessel here, and then particles accumulate within the tumor tissue. Now this accumulation also has to do with the size of the particles. The particles can extravasate, they can enter the tumor tissue, and they are large enough that they will stick around in the tumor tissue and without getting washed out too quickly. However, if we look at this, not the entire tumor is being treated um, in, the, in this scenario. There's a lot of area that would remain untreated. So now we applied surface chemistry. We're applying a polymer shield. This, uh, uh, this allows us to evade the immune system. So we are increasing the circulation and thereby we are increasing the probability of the particle to find the tumor. And second, we gave the particle some directions. So we are including a chemistry that will bind to molecular signatures that are found on cancer cells, but not on healthy cells. So the particle has some directions, a molecular zip code that, that it's looking for, and therefore we get this uh, much enhanced accumulation within the tumor tissue. So coming back to the question, what is a bio-inspired nanotechnology and what do viruses have to do all the, with, with all of this? Well, viruses, per definition, are nanometer scale objects. And viruses have naturally evolved to carry cargos and deliver these cargos to specific cells and tissues. So our idea was, rather than to make a nanoparticle from scratch using synthetic chemistry, to use a naturally occurring, a biology-inspired um, nanomaterial, specifically a virus. But since we all know viruses also cause disease, we thought to stay away from mammalian viruses that are infectious, but we use a plant virus that is only infectious towards plants, but doesn't infect uh, humans. So we have a safe, um, safe technology for potential translation into clinical application. Plant viruses come in many shapes and sizes, and shape is a very um, important and critical design parameter when we make um, nanoparticle formulations. So there's many shapes we can draw from, like cosahedrons, rod shape, filamental shape, zigzag shape, droplet shape. My absolute favorite is uh, this one. And I think if you take a very close look at the image, you can see what, uh, what these really are. <laughs> And I think with this, I'm uh, coming slowly to, uh, to an end of the first part. And I want to give a quick summary. So hopefully in this first part, you have learned nanoparticles are very small objects, uh, bigger than atoms, but smaller than objects we can see by the naked eye. They are large enough that they can carry cargos, such as therapeutics, but they're also small enough that they can navigate cells and tissues. Nanoparticles ba face biological barriers on their journey towards the target site. Nanoparticle shape and surface chemistry can be used in order to, to tailor the shape, uh, to tailor the particle properties and tailor the journey of the material. And lastly, plant viruses are naturally occurring nanomaterials and they come in many shapes and sizes. Are there any plant viruses that do affect humans that can be harmful? So plant viruses do not uh, replicate in human tissues. Um, there's, uh, they are unknown to produce proteins in, in human tissues, um, but um, probably the research, or there's nothing known about plant viruses affecting um, humans, but they are part of the food chain. 
Um, so we are exposed to plant viruses uh, probably on a daily basis. Um, I recently read an article showing that uh, hot sauce uh, contains a pepper mild mottle virus and it probably depends on the batch to batch. Um, uh, but yeah, viruses are part of the food chain and we have been exposed uh, to, to, to them. We just saw today about two doctors being honored with the neutrino discovery. How do neutrinos and nanoparticles correlate? <laughs> That's an uh, excellent question that I actually don't know how I would uh, answer this. Can, can I ask Glenn for... Neutrinos are much smaller and uh, th these nanoparticles are huge compared to the neutrinos. So probably not a huge amount of connection. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Dr. Nicole Steinmetz discussing biological nanotechnology and the possibility of harnessing viruses. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Dr. Steinmetz discusses the tobacco mosaic virus and how it can be exploited. Now, back to the talk. So from molecular farming to molecular medicine or from black-eyed peas to nanotechnology. So this uh, slide shows how we produce uh, plant viruses in the lab. Uh, we grow different types of plants. We grow cowpeas, uh, tobacco plants, as well as lettuce. And we use two basic methods to, to infect the plants to produce the virus particles. On the left is shown a mechanical inoculation where we take purified virus particles and we gently rub them onto the leaves. As soon as the virus enters the first plant cell, it will start its replication process and will then spread out systemically throughout the plant. Now, if you take a look at the coloration of these leaves, they are um, uniformly green coloration. And this is an image of a plant taken two weeks after infection. So you see the very typical mosaic symptoms, and these are caused by the cowpea mosaic virus. Uh, another plant that we use is a, a type of tobacco plant, and shown here a different type of infection, where we make use of a bacterium called agrobacterium, and we gently inject these bacteria containing the genetic information of the virus into the leaves. As soon as the virus enters the leaves, it will start its replication process and it will spread throughout the plant. So we use the plant as a manufacturing assembly line in a way to produce, um, to produce highly um, reproducible uh, plant virus-based nanoparticles. Because these materials are genetically encoded, each particle essentially is a clone of itself, we get very high uh, quality control of these materials. We can also produce them in quite high yields. So if we set up around 20 plants, maybe just the size of this podium, we, we would yield uh, 100 grams of leaf material, so a big Ziploc bag full of leaves. We can store these leaves indefinitely at minus 80. The plant virus will be stable, being frozen down. And we can then purify the particles whenever we need particles. And we do this by first homogenizing the material in a household blender, um, making a smoothie, and then processing through several protein extraction steps until we end up with pure virus particles. And with um, the collaboration with Krista Knight and Barry Brinegar, we actually have developed a music video highlighting uh, these processes. I needed a virus. One I could control, but I couldn't seem to find one around. Then I thought, plants. And I'm here to show you the formula that I found. In an incubation chamber, plant some seeds in a pot. Come on, doctor, do the propagation. When the seeds are ready, look and see what you've got. Come on, doctor, do the propagation. Put the virus on your hands and rub it onto the knees. Check out all the plants for symptoms of the disease. Then step one is done. Virus propagation complete. You've got to rub those leaves, yeah. Not too hard. Step back. Just like that. Oh yeah, I think you got the knack. 
Now we've got a lot of plant virus. What are we going to do with a lot of plant virus? Harvest all your leaves and toss them into a blender. Come on, Dr. to do the purification. Put the mixture in a centrifuge and see what it renders. Come on, Dr. to do the purification. Separated molecules all free of pollution. Find the viral envelope with mixing solutions. Then empty it through. Purify it. Well, I think you got the neck. <laughs> so well, once we go through the process of purification, we, we end up with quite high yields of virus particles. We can extract them at 100 milligrams to 500 milligrams per gram of infected leaf material. So that, that's quite a substantial amount that we can then utilize for further engineering and preclinical and potentially clinical applications. So if we look at the structure of these materials, they have been studied for many years. Um, this image shows the tobacco mosaic virus. Now this virus has been discovered more than 100 years ago. Tobacco mosaic virus was the first virus that has been discovered, and it has been used as a research tool, not only in nanomedicine, in biotechnology, and structural biology. Now, we have very good um, availability, or very detailed availability of the structure. So we can look at this on a macroscopic level, where we would see these particles form elongated structures, 300 nanometer in length, 18 nanometer in width, and they have a channel that is four nanometer wide. Now, four nanometer is much larger than many drugs are. Many of the chemotherapeutics used, many of the contrast agents in use are on the sub-nanometer size scale. So the interior channel gives us an environment where we can load therapeutics or contrast agents. So in um, a single common speech, there's a saying that uh, people look alike with their pets and um, it seems to hold true, it's a little bit to my embarrassment, but it seems to hold true in virology too. And uh, this is the cowpea mosaic virus, one of the particles we work with. And it turns out the cowpea mosaic virus and myself, we do share the same haircut, um, <laughs> at, at least every four years. <laughs> so knowing the structure of these particles, we can now do chemistry or genetic synthetic modifications to impart new functionalities. So we, we can put, put a drug on the inside, or we could put a a uh, chemical uh, ligand on the outside in order to give the particle direction to find these molecular zip codes. Now, oftentimes what we use as a tool, we make the particles fluorescent. So these particles now contain a fluorophore, a dye, that if we put these particles or the solution containing the particles under UV light or light with specific wavelengths, the particles will emit light and we can detect them in a fluorescent microscope. And we can make use of this to now track the particles in vivo. And one of the experiments we did is we made a fluorescently labeled virus, and we tracked its infectious process throughout plants. So what you see on, on the left is a plant that is uh, not infected, that is um, shown under UV light. Uh, sorry. The plant on the left is shown under white light, so we see a green plant. And then the plant on the right is shown under UV light. Uh, where we see the plant appears red and the virus appears in green. So we can see where the virus within the plant spreads out. We can also use this to do imaging in human cells. This is a cell that was where the cell membrane was stained with one fluorophore. The nucleus is highlighted in blue and the nanoparticles are shown in a, in a red color. And this was done using a human uh, breast cancer cell line. Having these particles now being fluorescently labeled, we can also go on and do in vivo preclinical studies using mouse models and fluorescence imaging systems. Now what you see here is um, two mice that carry a human colon carcinoma um, a xenograft. So these two mice have a human colon carcinoma uh, on, the flank of, of the, um, on their flank. Now, the animal on the left was treated with PBS, with phosphate buffered saline, so that's our negative control. And the particle on the right 
was treated with the tobacco mosaic virus carrying a fluorophore. And this study was done in order to evaluate whether just based on the nanoparticle shape and the properties of the particle, we could detect and target the tumor to visualize the tumor. And from the fluorescent images, we see um, yellow to red um, signal within the tumor indicating the experiment was successful, that we can use the nanoparticle and the fluorescent imaging setup in order to track these materials in vivo. So preclinically, we use optical imaging, fluorescent imaging as a research tool in order to evaluate the in vivo fates of these materials and study how we can tailor the shape or the surface chemistry in order to advance the, in, um, advance the applications. From a translational point of view, uh, fluorescent imaging is useful, but only for disease uh, that is uh, located on the surface and to tumors, for example, that we can access with an endoscope. But it's less useful for disease uh, of vessels that we might not be able to reach with an endoscope or metastatic disease disseminated uh, deep within the body. So towards a translational goal, we recently started looking at magnetic resonance imaging, MRI imaging. And some of you probably familiar with, uh, with these uh, types of instruments. Now, in order to image, uh, to, to, to detect a disease, we need a contrast agent. We need an agent that can detect a molecular signature, the molecular zip codes, if you will, um, and that can then signal um, give us a signal in the MRI instrument. Now, traditional um, contrast agents used are these uh, small molecule um, chemicals shown here as an example, um, gadolinium dota. Now, these contrast agents are small chemicals that will give us a positive signal in the, the, MRI, age, uh, in the MRI instrument. However, the small molecule agent does not deliver sufficient payload to enable molecular imaging. So if you want to trace down a single cell, or you want to trace down um, just a few receptors that are overexpressed in, a, in an atherosclerotic plug or in a small metastatic lesion, we need to deliver sufficient payload to get enough signal that we could detect it with the MRI. So our idea was to use a nanoparticle, specifically the nanoparticles formed by the tobacco mosaic virus. So the idea here is that we take these agents, which are already used in the clinic, and we put them on the inside along this hollow tube of the tobacco mosaic virus. And we've developed um, the chemistries in order to do this, and uh, I don't want to go into the details of the chemistry. The point that I want to make on this slide is the contrast enhancement that we can achieve by loading the contrast agent into a nanoparticle carrier. So if we look at the T1 value, this is an indication of how bright the agent is. The higher the number, the better. So the T1, the relativity of the clinical agent, gadolinium dota, has a value of five per millimole per second. Now, if we look at our nanoparticle relativity, the value goes up to 35,000. So we are multiple magnitudes, um, multiple orders of magnitude higher in the T1 value, which also means we're increasing the sensitivity by, by several orders of magnitude. So we made these particles and characterized them, and we then set out to do an in vivo experiment to test the performance of these materials in a preclinical study using a mouse model. Now in this study, we looked at, the, at cardiovascular disease. So a very common uh, phenomenon, and especially in the Western world, because we don't exercise enough and uh, we, our um, diets are, are a high-fat diet, um, we, we develop atherosclerotic plaques, atherosclerosis uh, within the arteries. Not, uh, not all plaques are bad, but the ones that rupture will, can lead to a heart attack or a stroke. So from a clinical point of view, it's important to identify um, um, the plaques that, that are bad for us, the rupture-prone plugs, and to aid with risk stratification. So our approach was to use a molecularly targeted uh, virus-based um, nanoparticle. So here again is the nanoparticle. On the inside, uh, we are labeling the particle with the contrast agent. And in this case, we use two contrast agent, uh, agents, a fluorophore, so we can do our preclinical optical imaging, and uh, gadolinium dota for MRI imaging. 
we can load up to 4,000 copies of these molecules on the inside of this nanoparticle. And then the outside was modified to give the particle some directions. So these particles were made. They were then injected into animals bearing a pterosclerotic disease, so plaque formation within the arteries. Uh, we administered our particles after one to two hours circulation. We sacrificed the animal. We collected the aortas. And this is what we are looking at in this image. These are aortas from four different mice. The first one was treated with our nanoparticle. Interior, gadolinium, interior, fluorophore, tobacco mosaic virus, VCAM. VCAM is the zip code. Um, VCAM stands for vascular cell adhesion molecule. This is a molecule that's upregulated in atherosclerotic plugs. So this gives us the direction for the particle to find the plug. And what we see is um, that we get good accumulation of the nanoparticle throughout the aorta. All the other three animals were control animals and we don't see any false uh, po positive signals. We can then take these aortas and make th sections of the aorta to get a more detailed uh, molecular information about where the particle localizes within, uh, within this plug. And if we take a look at this right image here, this is the region where we have the thickening of the blood vessel. Um, it's a very inflamed region with lots of macrophages, so in red are immune cells that are infiltrating this vessel wall, and in green is the virus particle just lining the vessel wall where the VCAM, the molecular subcode, is present, so our particle was effectively targeted to the site of disease. Um, we then also performed the MRI experiment to see whether we can tr potentially translate this into a clinical application. So these are the imaging studies were done here at CASE, at the CASE Center for Imaging Research. Um, so in these studies, we look, what, what we look at here are three mice, or three patients, if you will. Um, the bottom one was treated with PBS. That's the control, phosphate buffered saline. This animal received the clinical standard gadolinium dota, and the top panel shows the nanoparticle. Now, if we just take a look at the insets, this is where we see the aorta. And if you look at the image subtraction, this is the image here, the quantitative data. The only particle that lights up the disease is the nanoparticle. The free contrast agent and uh, the negative control don't show up. So we can use nanoparticles in order to increase payload delivery to image uh, molecular features within the body. So coming to an end of uh, the second part, the conclusions are virus-based nanomanufacturing is fun. Um, nanoparticles enable large payload delivery of contrast agent to enable molecular imaging. And of course, having established molecular imaging, we can now also replace the contrast agent with this therapeutic in order not to only image the disease and attack the disease, but to treat the disease. For the imaging with the increased payload, are there concerns of toxicity effects? Yes. So. So the question about toxicity, especially when using a gadolinium-based uh, contrast agent, is a very, very important point. Because if we deliver a high payload to the disease side, we are also increasing, potentially increasing payload in other organs. Um, so the advantage of the protein-based material here is that the protein is cleared metabolically quickly from the system. In contrast, uh, some inorganic materials or synthetic materials might persist within the body over longer time periods, which may lead to um, gadolinium coming off the chelator, therefore causing toxicity. Um, we haven't done the full workup yet on the toxicity studies. It's a very important next step um, to, to evaluate uh, potential um, new toxicities that uh, we haven't observed before. Does the, uh, does the viral coat need to be broken down in order for the contrast agent to work, or can it work inside the, the virus still? The virus particle for the contrast agent to work does not need to be uh, broken apart. Um, and uh, we, we actually like to have the particle stay intact for as long as possible uh, for uh, the, the question that actually was just asked uh, to avoid toxicities. So if the particle stays intact and we excrete the contrast agent with the payload, 
um, that's beneficial for the imaging applications. Um, when it comes to therapeutic applications, we can make use of different chemistries that would either aid the particle to fall apart and release the cargo or use other mechanisms to release the payload at the target site. I was wondering to what extent are plant viruses stable without spontaneous mutations? Some animal viruses <coughs> clearly mutate frequently and others are more stable. Yes, um, yes. so mammalian viruses tend to uh, mutate. That's why some viruses are very challenging to treat or it's challenging to create an effective vaccine. Um, plant viruses can also do this in the plant. So we notice this when we, when we make modifications to the virus and we produce it in a plant, we have to very carefully monitor that no uh, mutations occur in the plant. However, in the clinical setting, plant viruses do not replicate within, uh, within the body, so there's no replication and uh, they don't make copies of themselves within the animal or human uh, system and therefore there's no risk of, uh, uh, of mutations to occur during, during the clinical application. It becomes a risk in your manufacturing process. Yes, it, it can be a risk in the nano manufacturing, and there, if we go to scale up, we have to include um, quality control points in order to monitor um, the, the quality assurance of the particles. How far away is this technology from uh, human uh, application? So with the imaging applications, we are definitely still at the research sta stages uh, as well as with the therapeutic applications. Well, we do have um, an immunotherapy that uh, has been shown to be very effective in various animal models. And we are currently at the stage to write grants to support larger animal studies, um, maybe with the goal to in five years or ten years to, to advance this to the next step. But yeah, there's, it's a long road from, from the bench uh, to, to the bad side. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Nicole Steinmetz. Dr. Steinmetz was awarded a prestigious National Science Foundation Faculty Early Career Development Grant to support her work on the tobacco mosaic virus. In the second part of our talk, we learned about virus-based nanomanufacturing. In our final segment, Dr. Steinmetz will discuss the 2014 Ebola epidemic and the application of the tobacco mosaic virus to disease diagnosis. Now, back to our talk. So this um, brings us to the third part. And uh, now I want to just slightly switch gears and highlight the, the different applications that we can, um, where we can apply nanotechnology or biology-inspired nanotechnology to diverse problems. Um, so far, I talked about imaging applications, therapeutic applications. Now, what, I want to talk about the 2014 Ebola epidemics. So the 2014 Ebola virus outbreak was the largest Ebola virus outbreak in history. And uh, it has not only affected the West African countries, but also U.S. health care workers, um, the U.S. as well as Europe, because there's a lot of air travel and U.S. health care workers um, go forth and back between the West African countries and the U.S. So recognizing the emergency and urgency of the Ebola virus, not only affecting West African countries, but even there was a scare in, in Cleveland with uh, the nurse being on a plane um, coming to, through Cleveland to visit family just a few days before she was diagnosed uh, with the disease. Now, funding agencies, including the National Science Foundation, had recognized this urgency and they put out diacolic letters. And here's a diacolic letter from the National Science Foundation, which was published just about a year ago, um, asking uh, researchers, in light of the recent emergence of the Ebola virus in the U.S., the NSF is accepting proposals to conduct non-medical, non-clinical care research that can be used immediately to better understand um, how to um, to better understand how to model and understand the spread of Ebola, and so on. So. NSF, as well as other funding agencies, put out these calls urging researchers to think about how can we contribute to um, confining and eradicating this disease. 
Now, as you've learned throughout this talk now, I, I don't work traditionally in infectious disease and I don't work on Ebola virus, but, but I've dedicated my career to engineering virus-based materials for applications in medicine. So I sat down and educated myself about what are the challenges and what are the opportunities with the 2014 outbreak and is there any bioengineering design that we could contribute to help with the disease. So I did the obvious thing and discussed it with a breast cancer researcher, um, with uh, Dr. Ruth Carey, a good friend and collaborator. She's a professor here at Case in pharmacology in the School of Medicine. Now, I, I discussed my idea with her because I needed an expert in molecular biology and an expert in, um, in molecular biology techniques that are used to, to detect RNA molecules. And I knew that she's using these techniques to, um, to study breast cancer and to evaluate novel therapeutics in breast cancer. So also she wasn't trained in Ebola virus or infectious disease, but as an interdisciplinary team combining nanomanufacturing, nanotechnology, bioengineering expertise with molecular, um, molecular biology expertise, we developed a proposal to, to develop a novel tool for an Ebola virus diagnostics. And we were one of the very few teams that were awarded a grant and uh, the grant was awarded earlier this year. We started the research in March and I want to show you some of the progress that we've made uh, in this uh, relatively short time. Now before I go into the, the data and share, share with you the research project, I'll give you a bit more background on Ebola virus. So Ebola virus causes hemorrhagic fever it has a high mortality rate, so high death rate, 25 to 90 percent, depending on the strain. Ebola virus is infectious in humans and in primates, bats and pigs are host. So therefore, Ebola virus presents a hazard, not only to human health, but also to food and agriculture. The symptoms start two days to three weeks after contact, and the initial symptoms are flu-like. So we start with fever, sore throat, muscle pain, headache, and, and so on. But this will then quickly turn into more severe symptoms, uh, liver, kidney failure, internal, external bleeding, and the high death rate is associated um, due to the low blood pressure from the fluid loss. So because the initial symptoms are flu-like, it's very important that we have an accurate assay to diagnose the disease um, effectively. So as a materials person or bioengineer, I was curious, mostly curious about the structure of these particles. So they are filamentous particles, and you might have seen um, this uh, pseudo-colored uh, image, which was often used on the, in the news and uh, B BBC news. So Ebola virus is not blue. Um, this is a pseudo-colored image. Now we have a single-stranded RNA molecule and we have this filamentous particle which reminded me of some of the plant viruses that we work with, a highly elongated structure. Now Ebola virus, there's currently no treatment and no vaccine licensed and approved. During the last outbreak, um, there were treatments, ZMAP um, was a treatment that has been used to successfully treat uh, Ebola patients. Interestingly, this um, not a plant virus at all, but an antibody cocktail that's produced and manufactured in plants. Now this, um, uh, this therapeutic along with others and vaccines are now undergoing clinical trials to advance uh, to, into clinical use. Now with no treatment or vaccine currently available, detection and monitoring is the first step and currently the only step and the only option to prevent the spread of the disease. So we looked into what are the current assays that are, that are being used to detect the, the virus. And there are two basic assays. One is detecting the proteins, and another assay is detecting the RNA, the genome of the particles. Now if we look at the structure, this is taken from the New England Journal of Medicine, we have this filamentous structure the exterior is, a, is an envelope that carries some of the proteins that uh, plays a role during the infectious cycle of Ebola virus. And what I was mostly interested in is the central part, where we have a nuclear capsid 
and single-stranded RNA. So this is the genome of the virus. And the coproteins, the nuclear capsid, is protecting this genome. Now, the, one of the assays used to detect the virus is uh, called RT-PCR diagnostics. Now, in this assay, we are detecting the, the inner part of the virus, the genome, the RNA. And what, what is done in this assay is we start out by collecting a patient sample. We then lyse and remove all the proteins, because we're only interested in the RNA and the genomes. Um, we then go through additional processing steps, and we get a numerical readout. Now, with any diagnostic assay, it's highly crucial that we have a reliable positive control and negative control that we can use in all our assays to mitigate any false negative results. Now, the best control that we could use would be Ebola virus. But of course, at the port of entry or at the hospitals, we don't want to have purified Ebola virus to use as a positive control. We want a safe positive control. And looking through the literature and looking at the assays that are being used, it has been extremely challenging to produce a reliable positive control. So traditionally used are synthetic RNA transcripts, so short RNAs that can be used in order to spike the samples. But RNA as a chemical molecule is not a very stable molecule, so it can't be stored over long time periods. And most importantly, it cannot be added to the initial sample, it can only be added at later steps, which means if an initial processing error occurs, we won't know about it because we didn't add a control at the initial steps. So several companies have realized this, and in the 2014 Ebola virus epidemics, several new RT-PCR kits were FDA emergency authorized and, and put in place at various ports of entries. Now these kits are now using yeast as a control sample. So a microorganism that contains RNA molecules and protects these RNA molecules, and this is now used to, to spike the samples. This is certainly better than using naked RNA molecules. But we thought, well, yeast and a virus, these are two completely different beasts, and yeast doesn't realistically mimic, uh, mimic the virus. So here's our proposal. Looking at the interior structure, we have a single-stranded RNA molecule encapsulated in this nucleocapsid. If we look at the tobacco mosaic virus, we have a biomimicry. There's an RNA molecule that's encapsulated into the protein. The protein stabilizes the RNA. So the idea was we take a synthetic RNA transcript that, that's traditionally being used as a control, but we make it more stable. We encapsulate it into a coat of the tobacco mosaic virus to make it stable um, so it can be stored properly and over extended time periods. Most importantly, it can be used to spike the initial sample. So we have a positive control in each of, um, of, e in each of the processing steps. So this is the nanomanufacturing scheme. We start out in the greenhouse where we produce tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, we then take these particles and we take them apart into its components, um, coat proteins and its RNA. We, we throw out the RNA because we're not interested in the genome of the tobacco mosaic virus. We, we created a synthetic genome. Now this genome now contains a small fragment of the Ebola virus. This fragment does not encode for any infectious material. It does not replicate, so it's a safe um, short sequence um, replicating um, the, the, or mimicking the Ebola virus. We combine this with uh, synthetic sequences from the tobacco mosaic virus and trigger an assembly to make an Ebola virus hybrid sample. And you, you notice from this transmission electron micrograph that these particles are much shorter than the tobacco mosaic virus, and this is done by design. So these particles are now also no longer infectious towards tobacco plants. So we have a safe material that's um, also non-infectious -infect towards plants. So with this, um, we, we've just finished the bioengineering design. Uh, we have completed the assembly of these probes. And we are currently investigating these, the utility of these probes in two, in two different assays. 
One is the standard um, assay, the high-tech assay that involves specialized laboratory equipment um, using an RT-PCR instrument that will give us a result that looks something like this, that we can then turn into numerical values to, to get an answer whether Ebola virus was present in, in, in a sample or not. But we can now spike um, tissue samples with our positive control in order to test whether any processing errors occurred. Our next phase will now focus on the design and implementation of a low-tech assay so that it could not only be used at the port of entry or in Western countries where we have the cold chain and infrastructure to do these experiments, but to do a low-tech assay that could be used in the field. And our idea here was to use a colorimetric assay. Uh, we are not using any laboratory equipment. The only source that we need is heat, but we could potentially make a fire um, where, wherever we need to, to heat up the sample. And the basic, um, the basic uh, readout here is that if the sample is present, the solution will turn blue. Uh, the starting solution is purple. Um, this is a very preliminary result. There's lots of optimization that still needs to be done. Uh, but this will be the focus um, of the next phase uh, of the grant. These are relatively short-term grants to, to make a, a quick and immediate impact. So we finished uh, the manufacturing design, and for the next uh, few months, we will focus on the implementation and the probe and the high-tech and uh, low-tech assay. So this will bring me slowly to an end. Um, I hope I gave a good overview of our research program today. We start in the greenhouse. Uh, we engineer nanoparticles that we apply in applications ranging from biomedical imaging to therapy um, as well as uh, diagnostics. Um, this work is done by a fantastic group of uh, graduate students, postdocs, and research professors in my group. Occasionally, we get out of the lab and we go for our, our, our annual camping. And to yeah, hi highlight maybe a few things, so this is the current team, uh, uh, a large group that is, uh, keeps growing and growing. Um, we have many collaborators at CASE, um, national and international collaborators. And I want to point out uh, Pino Strangi, who is sit sitting in the audience. He will give a talk uh, next week um, here in this lecture series. Uh, we are collaborating together on using viruses to, to develop novel photonic materials. And, um, and I'm sure, I don't know what Pino will talk about uh, next week, but he, he, he might mention uh, some of those studies. Um, we are funded by the National Inst Institute of Health, by the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, as well as several foundations that, that make this research possible. Not only I bring in money, but my students have also been very successful in obtaining their own independent fellowships or case-sponsored uh, fellowships. I'll be happy uh, to take any further questions. Thank you. This lecture is part of the Origins Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. It has been brought to you with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, and MediaVision. For more information on the Origins Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.